Jan, I am very happy to be sitting here with you tonight. Um, as few of the students probably know, we meet more often here in my office because we have the great privilege in working together already for so many years. But today we would like to hear from you and learn from you about your many decades of experience in serving in public office. And actually, we were just having a conversation um, in preparation of uh, this evening and looking at the multiple crises in which our world finds itself today. We were just discussing how it seems that we live in the time about which St. John Paul II said that the Catholic laity has a very special calling. And I think when we speak about Catholics in public office, that very much counts there. But I think for our students to, to understand better your motivations and what you have achieved and what you have done, it's always go, good to go back into history. And in fact, we were just discussing also the horrors of the current war in the Ukraine and what is being done to the Ukrainian people. And that, of course, makes one think back into the history. You were born in 1960 in what was then Czechoslovakia. You were uh, born in the part that is today Slovakia. And you were born in, at that time, a communist country. Could you share with us a little bit how was your life growing up under a communist regime? First of all, thank you, Christian, for this idea, for this wonderful community. I feel honored to be welcomed in Slovak at the beginning uh, by, by great uh, resurrection hymn and then old Slavic and uh, English. So you are truly international and, and resurrection is the most important event and message and certainty for our faith. So thank you again. Yeah, I know Christian for many years or several decades, also from Slovakia where he went frequently to, to teach or to learn or to exchange um, good ideas or motivations with young people. And, um, and I'm glad that there are so visible uh, good fruits of, of these endeavors. Um, people are divided into very young, young and well-looking. So here we have all categories, but I'm, I'm really um, encouraged by such strong young community. To your point, <clears throat> yes, I was born a long time ago, in 1960, then uh, uh, the bloody part of communism or Stalinism turned into, let's say, more a human part of socialism. Uh, Czechoslovakia declared itself, regime declared it uh, uh, as, as Czechoslovak Socialist Republic. So since I was born, we have been in, let's say, new category of state. It was time of uh, Soviet dominance uh, because Sputnik already was, was up, then Gagarin went up. Uh, this race for the dominance for taking over not only here on, on, on land or uh, globe, but also upside in, uh, in the cosmos was uh, somehow uh, taken over by communism because communists invested much more into science, technology than into sociology or pedagogy or uh, they, they wanted to dominate in uh, all those spheres. So that's why uh, we in our family studied mostly uh, technical sciences because my family had a problem with the regime and uh, the problem was uh, had the, the same name as me. Uh, I got the name after my father's brother, my uncle, disappeared in 1953, February 7th. It was still time when Stalin and Gottwald uh, were alive, total Italian leaders or dictators. And uh, he was a young student, 26 years old and he was uh, active in anti-communist movement. So one night he disappeared and until today, we don't know where he's buried and what exactly happened, but he was 
deported, taken away by Secret Service. Stalin had a saying, very, <clears throat> very cynical saying, is there a man, there is a problem. If there is no man, there is no problem. Liquidation of problems through liquidation of people. So it, it uh, dramatically uh, changed life in family and, and uh, was our burden, especially of my parents and, and, and grand, grandmother, which uh, expected her son all the time till the, till the end, till her death, that she may get some news, some, something may happen. He may appear from somehow because some people told that he ended in Siberia, in Gulag, but he did not. I even met as deputy prime minister, you mentioned Prime Minister Putin in 2011, and I asked him for help to seek my, my uncle some traces or archives in Siberia because uh, FSB in Russia ha has, has uh, uh, such uh, archives in possession, but they, did not, they found nothing. So uh, uh, this was politically very significant uh, uh, sign or part of my uh, development and education. Was that event for you also something that planted the seed in you to go into politics later yourself? Probably yes, somehow, because I always felt like we should uh, investigate, we should do something to prevent anything like that to happen again. Because these were quite usual, uh, or there were many, many people persecuted. Bishops have been uh, sentenced to, to lifelong jails. Uh, Slovakia was and is Catholic country, and church and believers were the most uh, consistent force against the regime. And it started with blood, bloodshed, then with some manipulations and selection and double class citizenship. 68, maybe you know something, maybe it's uh, uh, something Perhaps was present. It was Prague Spring, yeah. We, we had reformed communism led by Dubček and uh, the title or uh, the logo was uh, Socialism with a Human Face. So it was attempt to reform socialism and uh, it ended like all, almost all attempts to change in, uh, in military intervention, occupation. Over 70 people have been killed when half a million troops came from outside to, to, or <laughs> to occupy Czechoslovakia, but they said they are coming from, for brotherly assistance. And they came for temporary uh, stay, but they have been stationed until the collapse of communism. So this was end of any Prague Spring or any hopes. And um, then the so-called normalization came which meant uh, cleaning or cleansing, even in the Communist Party system was, uh, became very uh, Kremlin-like, uh, uh, static and, uh, and conservative. And then, of course, I don't want to speak too much on history, but uh, um, hope or very hopeful sign came <clears throat> again from the East <clears throat> when Gorbachev uh, became uh, president, and he started to speak about similar words <clears throat> like Dubček, uh, Glasnost, Perestroika, but it was influential because it was from Kremlin. And of course, uh, something more dramatic happened a few years ago in 1978 when neighbor, Slav, Paul, John Paul II, Karl Wojtyla, uh, was, uh, was surprisingly uh, chosen as, as uh, successor to John Paul I. And uh, John Paul II really uh, inspired what we called later Velvet Revolution or Spiritual Revolution. I have a question on that, on the Velvet Revolution. But maybe I may ask you to, uh, to comment on an anecdote that I was once told by 
what seemed to be a serious uh, historian, who told me that on the day that John Paul II was elected, the 16th of October uh, 1978, 78. Um, that there was actually frantic phone calls going on bet between Moscow and Warsaw because apparently the, uh, the Polish, uh, what was the name of the Polish communist leader? I forgot. Gierek. Gierek, exactly. It was Gierek who said, this is the beginning of our end. Uh, that, that seems to be, uh, and, and there was actually, is, do you know anything of history of that? of that, was there really truly that outspoken concern already at that time? Probably yes, because they had been spying on John Paul II all those years, so. Yeah, uh, I think that uh, Edward Gierek and the whole Polish uh, uh, nomenclatura, but also the East, Brezhnev and, right. and Kremlin, underestimated Karol Wojtyla mm -hmm. right from the beginning, even when he was uh, uh, archbishop in Krakow, bishop and then archbishop, um, because he was, uh, I think, very, very intelligent, and he succeeded to to uh, to get results in a very acceptable manner. And and these results in Poland in in seventies were really striking because, for example, he was able to start holy masses in Nova Huta which was one of the places like we had in Czechoslovakia without church, future of society without religion. So Nova Huta was this example, and he started uh, masses on the small square, on, the, on the square with simple cross, and, and, and later on uh, people succeeded uh, through administrative processes and the communism even to build church. And it was like miraculous uh, result. And uh, Wojtyla was a very skilled and, and capable leader vis-a-vis -vis this monstrum or machinery of, of communist regime. So that's why I think he was also able, as a leader of the church, to deal with the whole system in a very uh, uh, intelligent, of course, spiritual manner and, um, and I think that we owe him, on one side, a lot for our freedom, at least, and that part of, of Europe. On the other, we should learn from him a lot on this Christian uh, leadership, how to live, how to love, how to lead like Jesus. That, that's the principle, the, the, the content of this leadership, to live, love, and uh, lead like Jesus. And of course, it's beautiful that I think one of the most beautiful moments when John Paul II for the first time visited Poland in 1979 was of course the mass and his sermon on Victory Square and where you have the famous uh, words of him where, you know, where he calls upon the Polish people to overcome a country without God and where you have this, this beautiful scene where these millions of people start clapping and they clapped like for 15 minutes or 20 minutes. And it was really, the, it was really one of those turning points in, in Polish history, because there the Poles really refound their, their identity as a Christian nation. And also he, he allowed those people to, to feel that they are strong because they are one united community. And they established after this visit uh, uh, trade unions, Solidarność, uh, very, very strong uh, union, which at, at the end won the political battle, the, the, the lay part of, of this mission. Which brings me, Solidarność brings me, of course, to, uh, back to uh, Czechoslovakia and the Velvet Revolution. There's a, a great book that was published last year, I think, uh, by Rod Rayer, which is called Live Not By Lies. Mm -hmm. And in this book, he interviews many people also in Czechoslovakia, asking them how they survived the times of communism. And it's very beautiful to see how the Christians built small communities amongst themselves. And it was those small communities that when the Velvet Revolution came along, actually seamlessly joined together and were, so to say, the core of the Velvet Revolution, also with the, with the I think, with the candles, but you can tell more about that. You were there, you were in the middle of it. 
can you share with us something how this all came to be? Uh, did Solidarność, that's the first question to, to, to get you started, did the movement of Solidarność have an important impact on the dissident movements like Charta 77 in Czechoslovakia or, or was that more of an independent movement? And how did the Velvet Revolution come about? Look, on one side we lived in one camp mm -hmm. behind the Iron Curtain, but on the other this camp was fragmented. Mm -hmm. It was not a uh, very uh, easy movement of people, but still there was influence. And spiritual dimension in, uh, in those years was a very important component, even in East Germany, in DDR. There were uh, protest gatherings uh, in churches, in front of churches, in Leipzig or elsewhere. Poland was uh, probably the strongest. <clears throat> Czechoslovakia was a bit different because uh, Slovakia is more uh, Catholic. The Czech Republic is, um, let's say, more atheist or mixed. So uh, in the Czech part, Havel is probably the most visible example, personality, uh, a civic uh, movement, civic dissent was stronger or strongest part. Charter, Charter 77 was a reaction to the Helsinki Act published in 77 and, and people, uh, activists, um, demanded from regime respect to human rights uh, codified and signed by many countries within the OSCE, within the CSE, uh, which is uh, Euro-Atlantic space on security and cooperation and third basket was human rights. Slovak part was, uh, as I said, uh, more Christian or Catholic, and uh, we had uh, mostly Christian descent, which was uh, about uh, small circles or cells uh, linked into certain networks. Uh, but this was a very significant experience because the first opponent of regime after war in Slovakia, again, was church. The war state was uh, strongly uh, labeled as church state or Catholic state, although it was not. And, uh, and, and in 1945, immediately after war, immediately, not when coup d'etat happened uh, in 1948, but immediately after war, Catholic uh, schools, institutions, printing facilities, charities or, or hospitals have been banned, liquidated, nationalized, because uh, communists in power understood that the major opponent for them, for their ideology and future, is Catholic Church. Then they oppressed bishops, persecuted lay people. One of the movements was called White Legion, where uh, many died under judicial and many uh, extrajudicial uh, attacks. And it continued throughout uh, decades. Uh, and um, the largest petition on religious, uh, religious or uh, civil rights was in 80s, 1985, when there was a, an anniversary of the uh, death of St. Methodius, our first archbishop, um, then uh, the first public gathering on, uh, on I would say, the, the overall change was Great Bratislava Great Friday, 25th of uh, March, 1988, when a simple and a very humble uh, prayer demonstration, prayer manifestation uh, gathered in Bratislava. Um, they they uh, uh, sang uh, papal anthem and state anthem and demanded civil rights and religious rights because that time Slovakia had no bishop, for example. Everything was empty, uh, like church without leadership. And the regime was so brutal that this small gathering was uh, violently oppressed, repressed, uh, but something started. 
in, in March 88, which we celebrate now as a uh, day of uh, fight for human rights, uh, process started which led to several other events in Czechoslovakia. Mm, then in August against the uh, Soviet regime and, and on occupation, then uh, commemoration of Jan Palach's death who, who um, sacrificed his life in protest, young student. And it, <clears throat> and it went up until the uh, uh, canonization of uh, Aneška Česka uh, in, in Rome, in Vatican, and in November, uh, a revolution came in, in, in terms of collapse of regime on the central level. So what I want to say, that with small but very significant uh, courageous protest of Christians, we have started one and a half year long period. Uh, at the beginning in Bratislava, 10,000 people maybe prayed rosary uh, in front of uh, uh, police power. And at the end, over half a million people prayed uh, Pater Noster on uh, Letenska Stran in, in, uh, in Prague. And this was unstoppable. And the regime collapsed um, with, without any, any resistance. So that's why we call it spiritual revolution or, or velvet revolution. And I wanted to stress that this Christian dimension in terms of uh, perseverance, but also a um, uh, very um, clear, mature demand for constitutionally defined rights, civil rights and, and religious rights, was very important because it was unbe un undefendable uh, from, from regime. They couldn't uh, simply, um, without violence, they couldn't oppose. Right. And violence is a temporary issue. I think that's something extraordinary in the whole fall of communism in Eastern Central Europe is that it, it happened so peacefully. Yeah. And, it, and it seems, it's, it's beautiful how you tell it, it seems that in, 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 most, in most of the cases, it started and it was sustained by prayer, yeah. by simple Christian families, whoever actually going and, and faithfully praying and slowly seeing that grow and grow. Now, the, the Velvet Revolution happens and you find yourself in the middle of it. And if I understand correctly, you were, you were, so to say, part of the transition period to democracy. How, how was that time? How, it must have been, in a way, a shock because you know, the regime imploded and obviously some new form of political leadership needed to start. So all the bright minds and the people of goodwill were asked so how, how did you get involved in that process and how did you experience that? I think that this uh, Christian descent, uh, which I told uh, was part of our history since, since the war, Second World War time, was great experience and a training, preparation for something after. And um, majorities in both countries, in both parts, uh, I mean in Czech Republic and in Slovakia were rather civil movements, or if I may say more concretely, the winner in Prague was Občanské Forum, Civic Forum, which is in museum now, and Václav Havel was the main protagonist. And in Slovakia it was called Public Against Violence, Verenos uh, Proti Nasiliu which, you know, is not something bad, but it's very superficial. Who is for violence, especially when everything goes so smoothly or uh, in, in velvet uh, system? So for us, and us I mean Christian Democrats, it was clear that we need something deeper, something what is really uh, program-oriented, program-led, not only a refusal of violence, uh, dreams about future. And uh, Public Against Violence is in museum, Občanske Forum is in museum. Christian Democrats in Slovakia still exist since November 1989, since time 
uh, of revolution or annus mirabilis. And I think this is an important uh, lecture because uh, the best recipe for change in life for good uh, works is ora et labora, in this order. Pray, but also do something. Bring your two fish or five breads and Lord will complete the work. But bring something, do something, uh, contribute. And in political sense, um, I, I'm sure that Christian democracy is a great concept of policy making or public life organization because it brings together faith and reason, or reason and faith, like two wings. And, and this was, and this is still visible because I don't want to uh, speak about uh, perfectionism, no. We, we are sinners, we, are, we, we do a lot of failures, but Christian democracy is, is a great concept. There are very important fruits for Europe when it was active or uh, uh, strong after Second World War. I mean, Schumann, Adenauer, I, I take usually this small, nice book, Pour l'Europe, Pre Europe which is a very simple vice uh, memory or legacy of Robert Schumann uh, for Europe. And without such legacy, we would be very poor or, or uh, complicated in terms of orientation. Uh, of course, we can spoil any legacy. This is an uh, example also in, in gospel. But, but if we keep uh, the, the, the orientation, the inspiration, the principles, uh, we can do great uh, works, jobs. And that's why I wanted to mention that in this transition, we immediately, still under communist regime, started to establish so-called Christian democratic clubs mm -hmm. as units, small. And from these small units, there was uh, uh, the whole structure built up until February, from November till February, and, uh, and the party was established. So I was one of those who build these clubs and structures and then the leadership. You're speaking about Christian democracy and it's very, very interesting to hear that in these times, because obviously you yourself are as keenly aware that Christian democracy has been very much in decline in Europe. Yeah. Uh, and sadly so in, in many ways. Unfortunately, also in Slovakia, uh, the, the Christian Democrats have, have also suffered at the polls. And Going back to what you earlier said, ora et labora, would you agree with the assessment that probably the most important reason why Christian democracy as a movement, as a, as a political direction, why it has been in decline so much is exactly because the ora is not preceding the labora. It seems to be very often to me that for many people, Christian democracy is just yet another political ideology that's just this, like you have Christian democracy and social democracy and you have yeah. uh, this and that, and you have liberal, um, liberal fort and, and the Greens. But would you, would you agree, or is that maybe a little bit too pious for me to say that, but would you agree that Christian democracy without people, without politicians, actually also having this personal relationship to God, that without that, Christian democracy cannot function? Look, I think that this is rather <clears throat> general uh, problem or issue, which doesn't mean impersonal. It's, it's uh, something what concerns all of us and the whole society, the whole church, and Christian democracy is, is part of it. And <clears throat> I think that the problem has two vectors or two dimensions. One is vertical, one is horizontal. Which means we have deficit in relation to God or there is a gap between gospel and our testimony. How we represent gospel. Is it a caricature or, or a relatively readable image? Uh, and that's 
rather personal challenge, invitation, mm -hmm. to, to be loyal to what we say or what we subscribe to. To be authentic. To be authentic. Mm -hmm. Not, not uh, by saying, not by declarations, but example. Uh, and the second dimension is uh, horizontal, which means in relation to the others, do we feel community, shared responsibility, at least awareness of, of something, or it's not my cause, it's not my problem, I have enough duties, I have enough problems. Uh, there is, I think that's, that's true. There is lack of unity of Christians or Christian unity in quest for justice, in quest for common good. And the result is not zero, but it's a minus. We suffer injustice. We suffer corrupted politics. We suffer anti-life legislation, etc., etc. So consequence of our individualism or lack of common attitude, common effort, lack of community in public life is, is, a, is a prevalence, dominance of negative tendencies like relativism. Ethical relativism now is a major force in European institutions, in European politics. Uh, so I, I'm not skeptical. Um, one of those guys it was not Schumann, but Monet said that when he was asked about future, whether he's optimist or pessimist, he had a very good answer, nice answer, inspirational answer. I am neither optimist, concerning future, I am neither optimist nor pessimist, but I stay determined. Young people who are educated, knowledgeable, uh, capable to understand, they should be determined to go on, to resist what is wrong or dangerous, and to promote common good, which was so important and is important, not only for Christian Democrats. When Christian democracy was really a, a creative force, if I may use this term, because creativity is something what defines us, reason, will, and capability to procreate and to love. Only when we use these four gifts fully, we resemble our creator. So this is invitation. And uh, uh, when Christian democracy was uh, uh, vital and, and creative or authentic, it helped Europe, post-war Europe, full of ruins and, and, and hatred or temptation to, to revenge, divisions, uh, with three pillars, three important uh, uh, legacies. One was uh, human rights, universal fundamental human rights, with a very special system of protection in Europe. It's, it's a unique system with Strasbourg Court and a European Convention on Human Rights. There, are no other continent, there is no other continent with such protection of, of human rights of individuals as we have on this continent. This is fruit of Christian Democrats from 1950s. Of course, when there are judges which are either corrupt or unprofessional, the system doesn't work pretty well. But legacy uh, belongs to Christian Democrats. Second was social market economy, soziale marktwirtschaft. Economy which is important, free market, but must be in service of society, not other way around. And the third legacy of Christian Democrats was and is uh, United Europe, which was not so easy to achieve, no. But it works, it's there, it can be dismantled, it can be improved, depends. But it's a legacy of Christian Democracy. Speaking about this determination that you just spoke about, um, that is so important in, in, in what young people also have to do, and I think it counts for all of us. You were involved in this transition. You then went on to have other senior functions, both 
as a EU commissioner and then later as a deputy prime minister and a minister in the government. If looking at this word determination that I think is an extremely important one in, in these times that we live, how would you say that your Christian faith and your Christian identity shaped you as a politician, as a leader in politics, to in a determined way seek to do the good? How did your, once again, your, your, your faith and your Christian identity, how did it shape you? I am not perfect, but I believe that without Christian dimension, without uh, faith, I wouldn't be that, uh, that man or everything would be very um, superficial or different. I don't know, but uh, for me, faith means everything in terms of, maybe you know, maybe not. I think there are not, I am convinced there are three certainties in life and faith helps to understand, together with reason, that cessa, it's so. The first certainty, because you can have a relative success and results and, and uh, salaries and successes, but what is 100 and 100 more percent sure in life that we all die, everybody, sooner or later, Memento mori is a great principle. It's not a fear, but certainty. Benjamin Franklin, Franklin said that only, the, only death and, and taxes. <laughs> <laughs> only death and taxes are sure. <laughs> but sometimes there is tax exemption. <laughs> but, uh, but death, death is 100% certainty. Second uh, certainty in life is that body ends, but our soul goes on. That spiritual life goes on after bodily life. Our soul is eternal. And here we need a bit of faith. And the third certainty, the most important one, which changed your life, if there is this awareness, is that God loves me me and us. If you live with this consciousness in full sense, not just sometime when I have birthday or Christmas, but daily, this makes a difference in life. And in, not in terms of life is sweet or easy, but that um, the most important issues in my life I still, are still ahead never behind, whatever happened in life. And I got this experience uh, several times. Five years ago, I got a uh, very serious disease, oncological. It was after very hard visits to India, Iraq, and uh, Sudan. But after this disease, I felt like I know what I never knew. I am stronger when I am weak, because God has more space to act, which is St. Paul, I had uh, uh, deep spiritual encounters, which helped me to, to feel this certainty, like St. Paul said, that I know what I believe, uh, and I am certain, sure, um, which is more than knowledge. And, um, and I think that... Um, um, this is important for, even for political battles or life, to embrace the other, not to nurture any enemies or to have enemies, but rather like Martin Luther King, you know, who was the man, he had a saying, we will get you on our side and our victory would be double. Because when you just outnumber somebody, minority becomes majority, it's one way, but uh, very weak, minority, majority. But when you go, go get your opponents on the same side, 
even in mathematics, is a plus from minus. It's a transition. It's a conversion. So I think this is very important for political life. And once I, I got assurance that uh, God is in politics as well, and then many times, but one was very special. If you recall recent history of marriage, or not history, but marriage in, in Europe or in the West today is, uh, is not uh, a very clear definition. And when in 2013, our government in Slovakia, a leftist government, wanted to change or adopt a national strategy on human rights based on gender ideology, I was in opposition, an opposition leader, major party then. And, which is even more important or striking, Germany adopted some changes uh, uh, um, uh, uh, definition of a man and woman in administration has changed or three sexes appeared. Uh, UK adopted uh, legislation on homosexual marriages. They called it or, or homo marriages. France adopted, I think 2013, mariage pour tous, package of legislation. And the United States almost final, finalized on the Supreme Court level decision on, on this issue. I felt like either we do something and stop this flood, or later would be over, too late. And with, we have 150 members of parliament in Slovakia, 90 is a constitutional majority, and we had 13 humble man, but it was, some people say, miraculous. Some say it was a speculation, a deal. But we got into the Constitution two sentences. I drafted, because we failed with the previous version, which was very complicated and complex. So I, I, I came then with the inspiration to do something or to write something really from Slovak legislation. And, uh, and simple and balanced. And these two sentences are, marriage is a unique union between man and woman. Slovak Republic comprehensively protects marriage and promotes its good. Very good words, strong words, unequivocal words. And uh, with 13 members, from opposition, we achieved uh, adoption of this constitutional clause. If I should speak on my whatever achievements, I signed accession treaty of Slovakia, 5,000 pages, the most important treaty in our modern history. My signature is there as chief negotiator. I, I saved billions of euros on highways as a minister because there was such a situation and corruption before. But this clause in the Constitution is the most important, and I would, wouldn't change anything if this is uh, uh, somehow uh, dealt with, because it's about culture. This is about principles. This is about values which are important for society. So I wanted to say that this ora ad labora is important, is fruitful. Uh, it's, it's the best recipe, simple and, and, and functioning. And, and we need to work on issues which are <clears throat> uh, principle for society. GDP and, and, and VAT and taxation and whatever, of course, can be different and may change every year. But there are issues which are uh, unquestionable are unquestionable principles, Benedict XVI. Mm -hmm. it's, it's beautiful that example that you give because I think that shows very clearly that one person, one Christian, can make an enormous difference in politics because we often tend, in the times in which we live, of the rampant secularization, I would even say militant secularization, one can easily lose hope as a Christian and think, okay, there's really not much that we can change in politics. There's not much that we can do. I must add something to, to, to your tribute. Mm -hmm. 
Because, yes, I did it. Uh, I proposed it. I, I collected uh, uh, signatures, and it was quite a difficult process, but it is connected with ICLN. On September 1st, 2013, we met at the end of our gathering. You may say more, but simply ICLN is, is a great uh, network. The ICLN is the International Catholic Legislators Network. Yes. For those who don't know the abbreviation. <laughs> and we met in, in Frascati, Italy, near Rome. And it was the first time when we were not sure whether we shall or not uh, meet Pope, because there was new Latino Pope. 13 he was elected in March, right. and we have been in August, and then uh, Sunday, September 1st. I will not forget because our conferences were usually about sanctity of life, uh, protection of family and marriage, uh, freedom of conscience, freedom of religion, the, these basic uh, building stones for Christian culture, society. And, uh, and we met Pope, and he spoke very eloquently. And uh, after this good conference, I told my son, it's time to, to come with initiative back home. And uh, there were such providential signs, which one can see only after or when you look back. In front, there is a fog or some hope for tomorrow. But that day, we met not only Pope Francis, but also behind the San Pietro Basilica, there was a meeting of Benedict XVI with his uh, school uh, team or uh, students of theology. So actually, we, we met that day two popes, which is, you know, historical pseudo or, or uh, miracle <laughs> one day. When I came back home and announced this initiative, which was very, very, you know, theoretical opposition to change constitution on such sensitive issue, it was early, early September. We have achieved a result, the final vote, 102 votes, uh, on uh, June 4th. Nine months between announcement and adoption. Nine months. It's not, you know, incidental time. The first reading of this proposal was voted on 25th of March, day of, uh, of uh, uh, unborn child or um, uh, Jesus, uh, how we call it in English, um, Annunciation, 25th of March. It's time of our anniversary of <coughs> Bratislava Great Friday, fight for human rights. Um, and, um, and it was published, and it means valid, in the, in the uh, Constitution on September 1st, 2014. So exactly one year. We have been 13, number of apostles and Jesus. Simply there were such signs, don't be afraid, just do what you can. Right. Small but reasonable initiative, and the rest is not in our hands. But it went through, and it was such encouragement. Many, many people opposed, and media attacked, and, and, and leftists totally throughout Europe. But it confirmed that there is also providential force. And we shouldn't be afraid if we do what is our role. Right. I think that's very beautiful, the way you tell that, because I think it seems to me, in, in my many years of working with politicians, that's the lesson that a Christian politician, that's what I've learned from people like yourself, that's the lessons Christian politicians need to learn. It's exactly as you say, you have to do what you have to do. And you shouldn't be too concerned about what the end result might be. Obviously, you hope for a certain end result, but that should not be your first concern. Your first concern should be to do what is right. And this always reminds me of of the beautiful words of Mother Teresa that I love to quote all the time when at the end of her life she was interviewed by a very critical journalist in Calcutta in India who said, well, you know, Mother Teresa, you and your ministry for 60 years helping the dying people on the streets, but look around you in Calcutta, there are probably more people dying on the streets than when you started your ministry. To which her answer was, and you, you could see that look in her eyes when she said that. 
She said, young man, God does not call me to be successful. He calls me to be faithful. And I think that's in a few words what you are saying there. Because the example you give here of the constitutional amendment in, in Slovakia, it really started with a faithful Christian who said, I need to do this. I feel that, as you beautifully describe it, I feel this is, this is my calling. This is what I have to do right now. You were a party of 13 members in the 150 member parliament. I mean, for any, you know, any calculation, you would think it never worked. But as you say, ora ad lobora, then providence started working. And from one came the other, and you achieved that goal even way above what, what you needed a minimum. So it's a perfect example that we Christians, when we are in leadership positions, and especially also in politics, our first concern should mean not be the next election or how successful are we going to be, but really from what you're telling, how faithful we shall be and let God do the rest and he will work through us in any way he sees fit. Which brings me to my last question before we go into some Q&A, because it's, it's one of the many aspects of your fascinating life that we haven't discussed yet, because basically your last visible public office function was the first EU special envoy for freedom of uh, belief and religion. And uh, this was a unique position that you helped create, in fact, as a position within the European Commission. And you traveled around, and we have also worked on this area of freedom of conscience and religion a lot through the ICLN. And you have traveled a lot for that, and you spoke already about Sudan, about Iraq. Voted, yeah. you know, the last uh, years uh, so much to that, and you continue to do so. Yeah, I uh, I tried to persuade uh, European leaders when there was very visible uh, mass murdering, better to say genocide, going on in Syria and in Iraq. I wrote more than seventy letters to leaders, including Merkel, Schulz, uh, and, and many others that something should be done, otherwise we are part of the problem. We, we contribute to this uh, mass atrocities in the neighborhood. We call it Near East or Holy Land, and, and we, we don't stop it. Uh, so somehow this initiative, this appeal, came back to me as a, as a boomerang, and Jean-Claude Juncker invited me <clears throat> to do something unprecedented because there was never any special envoy for freedom of religion or belief. There is special representative of the Union for Human Rights. So again, many oppose because why religion or religious freedom is so important or special and treated uh, uh, more visibly and the others are not. So it was very sensitive <clears throat> but meaningful because um, <clears throat> uh, religious freedom is not about, it's not more than other rights, but it's very central. Uh, I would say it's litmus test of other human rights. And my life, half of my life, I lived in totalitarian regime, so I can speak in details. How oppressed was freedom of conscience or religion uh, in totalitarian system? And if, if that's the case, then other rights have the same uh, value or, or uh, importance. So if freedom of, of thought, freedom of conscience, freedom of religion is not respected, then freedom of opinion, of expression, of assembly, of association is disregarded as well. There may be something theatrical but not real. And therefore we need to care about this deepest expression of human personal freedom in order to have many more other freedoms in society. So it's very central and critical for other rights. It's a civilizational issue because where you see society with freedom of religion, conscience, 
thinking and of course working also in some sort of uh, um, coherent um, approach to justice, common good, you see perspective, you see prosperity. Religious freedom and prosperity go hand in hand together. For example, religious freedom and security. So it's very practical. It's very important for believers and non-believers, not just for Christians or Jews or Muslims, for all, for all. And uh, it's so important because it's an expression of human dignity. Catholic Church at the Second Vatican Council adopted many important decisions, documents. One of them is called Dignitatis Humane, which is document on religious freedom. So they labeled it human dignity. And um, that's something crucial because uh, we love and we like and we pray, uh, we, we speak or, or ask for more rights, more, more liberties, but the source of our liberties, our freedoms, foundational principle to be said exactly is human dignity. But human dignity is not only about my rights, but also about my duties. If I don't care about my duties as citizen, as father, as husband, as a president, what kind of caricature uh, do, I, do I paint of the image of dignity? Uh, rights are rights will cease to exist or freedom will distract itself without responsibility. Dignity means duties and rights. And therefore it is very important and I speak about it because there is a nexus between religious freedom and human dignity. And religious freedom is under growing pressure. One problem is that, that most of global population Actually, four out of five people in the world live in countries where high or very high obstacles, this is a defini definition or def it is defined in, in professional literature, uh, are uh, persistent in society. High or very high obstacles. This number is so high because China is there, India, Nigeria, Russia, Pakistan, big countries, the biggest countries. So most of population is unlucky on this matter. And religious freedom, second bad news, is under growing pressure. Numbers are not improving, but getting worse. So this double uh, bad news or negative news is a call, invitation for a reverse. I would like to say, for religious freedom, climate change. Yeah, like, like we do for climate because temperatures are rising and our environmental problems uh, as well. So we need a climate change. But many more people, many more, hundreds of millions, some studies says 200, 300, depends, in the world suffer from religious persecution or re religiously motivated persecution. Therefore, even more urgent climate change is needed in religious freedom realities. And we should do something, at least to speak about it, be aware of it, organize networks and solidarity and support. I succeeded in my political life to help several people. And that, that's something very, very satisfactory in, in life. When, when you know that Somebody is alive because you raised your voice. I helped one man in Cuba, he's called Alfredo Batista, who was dying in his, in his cell after seven years and hunger strike. And somehow with the influence of my commissariat that I was commissioner and, and I asked for support also Barroso and Jerzy Buzek, I have succeeded to get men out of Cuba he was expelled, 
after half of his, half of his sentence, because he was sentenced for 14 years. And now he lives, we met in Slovakia, now he lives in Florida. Another guy is called uh, Yusuf Nadarkani. It's, uh, it's a Muslim convert who became Protestant pastor in uh, Iran, and he was sentenced to death because conversion in Iran is, means the death penalty. And under the pressure from the European Union, and I succeeded to get his, list, his name on the list of issues with Iran, he was uh, uh, pardoned. Then there was Asia Bibi, a woman, mother of five, who was sentenced twice. She was sentenced to death for blasphemy in Pakistan. Now she lives in Canada, and it, it was quite a dramatic story. And the last, not least, but in, in Sudan, we have helped nine people. One was Czech national, Peter Jasek, lifelong imprisonment for his missionary work. And the other one was also lifelong uh, Professor Ibrahim Mudawi. But uh, they have been released. And uh, it's such a joy when you help somebody to get out of, of imprisonment or um, death, death row. I say it because even one voice is more than nothing. Evil in the world is so influential, so successful, because it has allies. Very cheap and very industrious or influential allies. And I finish here. Three siblings are omnipresent everywhere, in Austria, in Slovakia, even in the church, many times you can see it. The first one is indifference. I don't care. It's far away. It's not my role. Indifference. The other one is ignorance. I don't know. I didn't know. I didn't hear about it. And the third one is fear. If I am scared to say something, to do something, because then I am noticed. When I helped <laughs> Asia Bibi, I got on the, on the uh, uh, press release of, uh, of Islamists in Pakistan. They have global networks, so it was really dangerous, but I was not there alone. There was a Pope Francis mm -hmm. and Jan Figel. Um, you never know, and there is certainty, as I said, that. Death is coming, but uh, yeah, courage is important. John Paul II, he repeated almost everywhere, ne se, don't be afraid. Because uh, that, that's important uh, quality of faith. And I say it because these siblings of evil are very influential and we need to, to bring uh, uh, antidotes engagement, education, and I'm here in the institution which, which is of this sort, and courage, simple but decisive human courage. I wish you that. Thank you so much, Jan. Uh, you spoke about Pater Damian and the signs that were up in Dovin. Pater Damian inspires. I think tonight we can put up a sign at ITI, Jan Fiegel inspires. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming all the way from Bratislava to spend this evening with us at ITI Catholic University. And we are grateful for your words of wisdom sharing with us. And thank you and hopefully for another time, another visit here. Mm -hmm.